This is Dr. Bess Miller, and I'm here with Dr. James Curran. Today's date is May 3rd, 2017, and we are in Atlanta, Georgia at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am interviewing Dr. Curran a second time as part of the Oral History Project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's Response to a Historic Epidemic. Today we are here to discuss your experience regarding CDC's early international work on what would become known as AIDS. I must ask, Dr. Curran, do I have your permission to interview and to record this interview? You have my permission and my uh, uh, joyful uh, anticipation. So, in 1983, that's about two years after the first cases were reported to CDC, there were a number of meetings in Europe in the spring and later in the fall where European participants presented their cases of this new syndrome. Uh, in fact, in November 1983, an MMWR report indicated that 267 cases had been reported with 94 from France, 42 from Germany, 38 from Belgium, and so on. Can you describe your thinking about these early cases in Europe as you were hearing about them? Well, the first pattern in Europe, um beginning in 1981 and 1982, looked very similar to what we were seeing in the United States, uh, predominantly in gay men in major cities. But about a year later, uh, cases were occurring in uh, people from Central Africa who were going to the original country that they'd been affiliated with, uh, mostly Belgium or France, uh, for care. So there were people from Zaire, what was then Zaire, going to Belgium and people uh, largely from uh, Cameroon or other places in Central Africa going to France. So they were seeing heterosexual men and women who are from Africa uh, being diagnosed with AIDS and cared for in the capitals of Europe. So following this a year later, an MMWR, once they had uh, identified 10 countries that would be sentinel countries for surveillance, there were 421 cases. And again, mm. 17 cases were reported from Haiti, 39 from Africa, who did <coughs> not follow in the pattern as you've described. How did the thinking progress and how was this connected to the U.S. cases? What was the thinking at that time? Well, in the United States, we'd seen uh, recent migrants from Haiti those who had um, been largely political refugees from Baby Doc Duvalier uh, coming to Florida with uh, conditions that fulfilled the case definition. And they were diagnosed in a male-female ratio, which was uh, precisely uh, that of the ratio among the refugees, that is about two or three men to every one woman, similar to the refugees and similar there, which would imply that there was a new epidemic, the new epidemic was also occurring in Haiti, as well as among these Haiti, Haitian refugees. The cases there were rather similar to the cases among the African uh, migrants uh, to Europe. So it, it was very compatible <clears throat> with a heterosexual type transmission epidemic, but there was as yet no real proof of that. There had been clues from New York City uh, earlier where women who were sexual partners of men with AIDS or of men who were injecting drug users themselves were immunocompromised or had AIDS with no history of drug abuse themselves. So I think many of us, and particularly those of us with our STD backgrounds, felt that this was an early indication of heterosexual spread. Now, did that affect <clears throat> your uh, understanding of the Haitian epidemic in the U.S. <coughs> I know there was uh, a lot of um, difficulty with from the Haitian ministry and so on of considering Haitians a particular risk group. Um, when did it become even more th of a thought that this was a heterosexual uh, transmission epidemic rather than all of these Haitians being in the closet men who have sex with men and so on. Well, one of, the, one of the most important things that CDC did in the beginning was accurate surveillance for AIDS with a very specific case definition. And when a new pattern came up, 
uh, since the cause was yet to be found, all you had were the diagnosed cases. And so it was much more difficult to attribute transmission unless you had some sort of contact. Um, when the cases in gay men, uh, it was easier to attribute that to sexual transmission. They were all in gay men, and there were a lot of studies that we were doing that suggested that it could be related. Among the Haitians, it was different. So the cases in uh, Haitian migrants occurred very soon after uh, they were, had a forced migration of nearly 100,000 Haitians from Haiti to Florida. They were not occurring um, among Haitian um, um, immigrants in the New York or Toronto or Montreal in, uh, in the Northeast, but only among these new migrants from Haiti. There have been cases of Kabashi sarcoma uh, reported in the literature uh, in, in Port-au-Prince earlier, even in the late 1970s. So it was very compatible with the, uh, such a migration. And the relatively equal incidence rate by uh, gender would also be compatible with both the epidemic in Africa, which was starting to appear, as well as uh, heterosexual transmission, as it would be with other, other STDs. But it was very difficult to prove that and the, um, the coincidence of the uh, autocratic dictatorial rule of baby Doc Duvalier and the political turmoil in Haiti, along with the epidemic of AIDS, was an economic and social disaster for the country of Haiti. Um, uh, Paul Farmer has written in his book that uh, it was wrong for the CDC to uh, identify Haitians as a group uh, who had a higher rate of AIDS or an incidence of AIDS, and perhaps even to uh, preclude recent Haitian migrants from donating blood. But I thought that we really had no choice. We had to report the data as we saw it, and most of the cases in Florida were among Haitians. And so it, it had to be reported as, as, it, as it came across. Now, 18 of the cases came from Zaire and nine from so-called Congo Brazzaville, so Central Africa. Did CDC have staff working in Zaire at the time, or what were we learning about um, this burgeoning epidemic in, in Central Africa? Well, Zaire had been the Belgian Republic of Congo and then would become the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, after Mobutu's death. Um, but it was the largest country uh, land-wise in Africa and the, uh, one of the largest population-wise in the continent. It had been a very important country from a mineral point of view, and it had been the site of the original Ebola virus epidemic in 1976 along the Ebola River in northern Zaire. Uh, CDC was uh, actively engaged in that investigation, uh, several people participating in it, including Dr. Joe McCormick, uh, Dr. Peter Piat from Belgium was also engaged. So we had uh, done investigations in uh, northern Zaire. Dr. McCormick had very strong contact, contacts with the Minister of Health and with the head of the hospital in, uh, in Kinshasa. So uh, he made a field trip on our behalf with a, his uh, chief lab technician, who was a crackerjack named Sheila Mitchell. And they went over there uh, joined by Dr. Tom Quinn from the NIH and uh, I believe Dr. Peter Piat from Belgium. They did an initial survey uh, and came back and reported them to the uh, very, in, you know, uh, increasingly interested uh, group at the CDC. What, what were some of the illnesses they were seeing and, and what led to actually having a field station there, which would be known as Projet Sida? Well, the diagnosis of, uh, the, the hallmark diagnoses in the United States were pneumocystis carinii pneumonia and Kaposi sarcoma. At the time, pneumocystis pneumonia required an open lung biopsy, and that simply couldn't be done in, the, in those types of circumstances. Uh, more likely, they had a kind of a wasting disease, sometimes extensive tuberculosis, uh, and occasionally Kaposi sarcoma, but often other types of 
of, uh, of in infectious diseases, uh, disseminated toxoplasmosis, mm -hmm. cytomegalovirus, or retinitis. And, and when uh, Dr. Mitchell, uh, Ms. Mitchell and Dr. Uh, McCormick were to test their blood for immunologic status, they had a very depleted immune system. So it looked very much like uh, AIDS, other than the specific opportunistic infections that we saw in the U.S. When Dr. McCormick returned, um, his information, even more than his personality, uh, told us that we had to uh, be, have a presence in uh, Central Africa, particularly in Kinshasa. <clears throat> we didn't have an international budget then, but the budget we did have for research and for investigation about the epidemiology of the disease uh, told us that we should be uh, in Central Africa, where it would be very important, not only for those in Zaire, but also for the world. Uh, so we uh, vowed almost immediately to establish a project in Kinshasa. Well, in retrospect, that seems so totally reasonable. Um, at the time, was, was there some question as to whether these two, quote unquote, diseases or syndromes were related? I mean, after all, in Africa, there's so many reasons for quote unquote slim disease or wasting diseases. Tuberculosis disseminated is common. What, what was pushing and motivating the sense that these were related? Well, the doctors in Central Africa um, had a similar feeling about this problem that we had in the United States in a sense that they had not seen them before. They had not seen people with these types of diseases. Sure, they had seen disseminated tuberculosis, but the other types of wasting syndromes, they just hadn't seen. And furthermore, they were becoming very common. Uh, Mami Amo Hospital, the main hospital in Kinshasa, had wards filled with people, and they were young men and young women dying of AIDS. In Africa, people were used to children dying. Uh, it was tragic, but AIDS would become the leading cause of death in the, in the continent, eclipsing all the childhood diseases which had previously been number one. So it was the immensity of it and the unusual type of disease that convinced those doctors and convinced us. And there was a similarity in the facies, a similarity in the syndrome when you saw the patients. They looked the same. So <clears throat> to head up this uh, <clears throat> Projet Sida, um, you ended up recruiting Jonathan Mann. Can you? Unfortunately, Jonathan Mann uh, perished in a plane accident in the 90s. Can you tell us about Jonathan Mann? I've heard so many things about him. What was he like? Why did you pick him? Well, Jonathan um, and I did not know each other. Uh, he was recommended, I believe, by Lyle Conrad at CDC. He'd been the uh, EIS officer in uh, New Mexico and then became the state epidemiologist. Uh, he was well known for a number of things. One was his ability to make a difference and to do uh, hard work and uh, very constructive, important public health work. Uh, he was very articulate. And when he was a, a student at Harvard College, he um, took a semester or a year abroad in Paris and became fluent in French and married a, a beautiful French woman. So he had retained his fluency in French, which uh, was the major language in Zaire. And he was looking for something different to do. Uh, so I thought it was certainly worth a chance to call him. And we had a chance to meet, and he volunteered on the spot. I insisted that he and his family visit first um, so that they knew what they were getting into and that they were happy to do it. And they did, and, and then they made the decision to move there. So just to hold on to discussing Jonathan Mann a little bit more, what, what was his leadership style in Zaire? How did it turn out for, for him in Zaire? Well, the, you know, I, during Joe McCormick's visit, there had been um, an almost simultaneous visit planned by investigators at the National Institutes of Health and the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Belgium. Uh, rather than go with competing trips at the same time, 
they elected to go as a team. <coughs> and we uh, made the first move to establish a, um, a project there. But um, the NIH and the Institute of Tropical Medicine wanted to be part of it as well. So the thought was that we would send an investigator from each of those two units to be part of a three-person team to found Proje CETA. Now, um, Jonathan Mann was the project director. That was as much part of the fact that we paid about 75 or 80 percent of the budget, and we insisted that he be the project director. Um, and so the laboratory director was uh, Skip Francis, who came from the National Institutes of Health. And, and then uh, there was a clinician named uh, Joe Kolobunders, uh, Bob Kolobunders, Robert Kolobunders, who was the clinical person from uh, Institute of Tropical Medicine. But again, we had about 80% of the budget, and Jonathan Mann had about 110% of the control. He was a, an electric figure, um, uh, larger than life, uh, and um, how was, so? was really unbelievable. He was, um, you know, absolutely fluent and oratorical in both uh, French and English. Uh, he uh, could be gracious. He could be overwhelming. He could be um, filled with ideas. He was very bold in all his approaches. Uh, and he worked with certitude. Um, he, you know, the, the other colleagues worked closely with him, but, um, you know, he was, he was clearly the leader uh, during those, um, his time period, his short time period in Zaire. Uh, you know, there were times when there was some um, uh, rustling around about who's in charge and who gets permission to do what, and, you know, all of them, as anybody in global health knows, have the tyranny of their home agencies to deal with and the expectations that they're showing their own agency that they're making a contribution. And um, Jonathan Mann was the type of person, he, oh, he was there for two years, and that goes from moving there, uh, setting up a laboratory, and he was not a laboratorian, using experimental HIV tests because they were not let li yet licensed, uh, working in conditions he'd never seen before, both physical conditions and, and a, a hospital and, and uh, medical conditions. Uh, and he went and resulted and published 22 or three peer-reviewed articles in that first two years. So he just took over and did it. Hired 100 people. I mean, <laughs> he was a force of nature. How did it go with regarding to the Zarwa or Congolese uh, ministry and hospital leadership. What was the relationship of Projet Sida to the country? Well, the key representative was uh, Dr. Uh, Bila Kapita, who was the chief of medicine at the Mamiemo Hospital. So, a well-respected cardiologist and a visionary who um, welcomed us with open arms, uh, provided space, and provided some political cover um, it was a difficult country because of the tyranny of Mobutu. And there were uh, people around who were hangers on of Mobutu, uh, people that, you know, had to be feared but not trusted. So there was a lot going on in that part of the country, but I think in general, uh, uh, Dr. Mann and, uh, and his successor, Dr. Ryder, uh, were able to skirt around that pretty well. Uh, when Dr. Hayward took over, it was uh, beginning to crumble, and the country uh, fell apart, and eventually the project had to close. But they were able to uh, deal with the Ministry of Health pretty well, um, and the talent that they could recruit among the Zarawa. The hired eventually recruited two or three hundred people who were native Zarawa. Um, and the physicians that they recruited were absolutely top-notch. Um, when you have uh, a natively very intelligent people with no opportunity and you provide opportunity, you really get the very best people and the most motivated people. Um, 
Now, one doctor, his chief young doctor, I remember, um, met him. He, spoke, he had spoken five languages, but not English. And we challenged him to give the, Jonathan Mann gave the first talk on AIDS in Africa at the first international conference in Atlanta. Um, then there was a next conference in Paris. And we challenged the Zayarwa doctor to give a keynote speech in English. Uh, in the first year, he learned English, and he was terrific. Uh, unfortunately, shortly thereafter, he, was, he died in, a, in an auto accident, um, and there was speculation that maybe it wasn't an accident. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of important work accomplished in Zaire. Can you, are there some aspects that stand out in your mind of some of those early findings out of Projet Sida? Well, it's, you know, it seems uh, easy now that we know so much about how HIV is transmitted to think about how you could learn about it when you didn't know the cause. Uh, there were a lot of concerns about household contacts, and there were studies done among household contacts who are not sexual and not birth contacts of AIDS, showing no evidence of immunosuppression in large numbers of households where there were both mothers and fathers who had, who had AIDS. Um, there was also the relationship between um, HIV and malaria was first uh, explicated by Dr. Alan Greenberg, who was an EIS officer traveling from the malaria branch and working with Jonathan Mann. Uh, it had been found that, that um, childhood malaria was closely associated with uh, HIV. But when they did a study, they found out that it was closely associated with receiving blood transfusions, which then caused infection with HIV. And that led to a great concern about blood transfusions from malaria in, in the developing world. Um, the lack of evidence of arthropod-borne transmission was documented in Zaire. Uh, terrific information on sexual contact uh, of HIV and, and sexual transmission from women to men and men to women. And then large numbers of cohort studies of opportunistic infections and other things. In terms of um, CDC's support of this international work or the HHS support of this international work. Was that at issue at that time? Uh, were you using domestic funds? How did this, uh, how was this received from the OD at CDC? Well, the, uh, we, were, uh, we were unfortunate to come into the AIDS epidemic early in the Reagan administration when there was a hiring freeze and essentially a funding freeze at the CDC. But we had an enthusiastic group of people who jumped on the problem even though we didn't have much money. Um, we were uh, short of um, hard-to-fill positions like statisticians, and we couldn't really hire people, but we could detail EIS officers like yourself and others to work on a problem because it was obviously important. Uh, we didn't have much money, but then money did start to flow uh, in 1982 and then a little bit more and more later, but it was largely for epidemiologic investigations and surveillance initially. I made the argument, I think quite successfully, and, and Bill Fagey was our director, uh, that our epidemiologic investigation money would be well spent in Zaire, that more could be learned there for the same amount of money that we would spend in the United States. And so that, that's how we, we started it. It wasn't don't ask, don't tell, but it also wasn't advertised as an international project. Well, moving to a second international site, and that was Projet <coughs> Retro C, which was uh, a site in Cote d'Ivoire. So uh, in 1987, you and Joe McCormick and Kevin DeCock went to the third international conference on AIDS in Washington, and there was a lot of presentation on different retroviruses and diseases in West Africa. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and what led to the idea of actually having a second site in Africa? 
Well, when the virus was discovered in, in, in mid-85, um, a, a blood test was developed which could be used to screen blood donations. And it was uh, able to screen out HIV-1 from the blood supply. When a second similar but totally different virus in a way, HIV-2, was found in North and Western Africa, Senegal, I think, Cote d'Ivoire, other places, there was a big concern that this might be a different epidemic and that also it wouldn't be, um, it, it couldn't be screened out uh, from the blood supply or eliminated as a diagnosis uh, for people who might be ill. So we felt that we had to learn much more about HIV-2. And that was num reason number one, that Cote d'Ivoire was an appealing site for um, studies. Reason number two was the, in the potential instability of our project in Zaire because of Mobutu and the increasing political instability in his, re his regime. By then, Dr. Mann had gone to found the um, uh, World Health Organization Global Program on AIDS, and Dr. Ryder had uh, replaced him in, uh, in Zaire. Now, Dr. Kevin DeCock, as an EIS officer, again, I believe in malaria, had, uh, had worked with us uh, in Zaire and worked with Dr. Mann and had gone back to the uh, village in Ebola where the Ebola outbreak was to do a survey because we discovered in some of the stored blood samples in 1976 a viable virus of HIV that had preceded the epidemic. Mm. And he went back in 86, uh, 10 years later, and found the prevalence to be almost the same. So he had a, a strong uh, affinity uh, for working in Africa and was an outstanding scientist. Uh, during an earlier phase of his life, he had met and married a wonderful African woman in Kenya, and he was uh, the right guy to go to, um, um, to Cote d'Ivoire at the time. He had some training, uh, not only in Belgium and the United States, but in London, and he brought a very esteemed uh, colleague of his, Sebastian Lucas, who was a tuberculosis uh, expert and pathologist down to do some seminal studies at Cote d'Ivoire. Once again, was there support from your superiors, from the OD, uh, yeah, to we, form this second site in uh, Africa? They either urged us to do it or we convinced them to do it. But it was not at all secret or anything. It was, you know, it's a major commitment to establish a project like that because you have to have the resources to uh, guarantee the ministry and the, you know, renting and renovating lab space and uh, a lot of work. It's a major commitment, and it's a major commitment to the staff that you send over there. So it has to be done with, uh, with a sustainable plan. Now, was this one in collaboration <coughs> with other agencies, or this was only CDC? I think it was predominantly CDC, but there were collaborators from other countries who were there. I'd mentioned uh, Dr. Lucas from London, uh, and I think there were also collaborators from either Belgium or France. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Dacoc can tell you for sure. Um, so here again. There were institutes of Pasteur in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, and yeah. I know that they work closely with Institute Pasteur offices in, um, in Cote d'Ivoire, but whether they were directly involved in the project, I don't know. So, what happened to HIV-2? Um, was it found to be less significant, less virulent? Well, when um, we went more we, localized, it was uh, it was uh, it was less virulent, less transmissible, and and uh, less prone to epidemics than HIV-1. And, and so what you think might happen, happened. Um, initially, when uh, HIV-2 and HIV-1 were in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, HIV-2 and HIV-1 were approximately equal in prevalence. But, and, uh, and mortality was unknown. And as it was shown that HIV-1 was growing very rapidly, HIV-2 stayed more stable. And, and uh, eventually, HIV-1 overwhelmed HIV-2 as the epidemic pathogen. But that wasn't known then. Mm -hmm. And it also um, 
wasn't known the range of HIV-2 viruses from which you might want to protect the blood supply, for example. So there was a need to have quite a few isolates and to do quite a few studies, both in the laboratory and also for developing tests. So those were some of the important work that yeah. was done in Cote d'Ivoire. Other things, um, can you tell us a little bit about the sexual mores in Cote d'Ivoire, how that might have compared to those in Zaire? <clears throat> Well, Cote d'Ivoire was, uh, in, uh, in my impression, Cote d'Ivoire and uh, Abidjan was more of a, a tourist town. Uh, some people have called it the Paris of West Africa. Uh, no one has called Kinshasa the Paris of West Africa. It was a more of a large bustling, uh, but less, um, uh, less uh, diverse town. I remember visiting uh, both the staff in Kinshasa, which had grown to be quite large, and then the growing staff in Cote d'Ivoire. In Kinshasa, there were perhaps uh, 10 or 15 expatriates and 200 Africans, uh, almost all of whom were from Zaire. Uh, when we went to Cote d'Ivoire, there were maybe a half a dozen expatriates, and there were Africans from 10 or 15 different countries in the staff. They'd moved from Ghana, they'd moved from Cameroon, they'd moved from other Nigeria, all other countries, and they had migrated to Abidjan as a place to live and a place to be. Uh, there were uh, gleaming expressways. There were it was a more of a, a destination, it felt, than Kinshasa. Now all urban areas are destinations, but this was more of an international destination. The spread of the virus was quick, much faster in Abidjan than it was in in. Uh, uh, it began. Now, why was that? It be, well, it began with uh, a low prevalence, uh, much lower than in Kinshasa, and in a few years, it was double Kinshasa's prevalence. And it relates, I think, to the um, well. Who knows for sure how, what it relates to? But it relates to the um, type of environment that the city had, uh, migrating populations and tourism and a variety of things. Speculative. What about, it, it sounds like the collaboration with the Zarwa <clears throat> was very good. Similarly with the ministry at the, in Cote d'Ivoire. It, it was excellent in both countries. Why do you think that was? Why, I don't, well, would that be the same today if the United States wanted to set up uh, a field station? Well, of course, the CDC and, uh, and PEPFAR have been setting up uh, projects throughout Africa, I think largely with uh, great success and great collaboration. And I think that that has always been the experience of people uh, from CDC working in Africa, that they're uh, willing partners to deal with problems that affect their population. I guess that reflects on, on CDC's reputation. Um, and I guess at that time, CDC already had a reputation. A reputation from uh, working in Africa since its beginning, uh, the eradication of smallpox, uh, problems like guinea worm, and the immunization programs that were going on in Africa, and consultations in, in a variety of other diseases. So moving along, um, <coughs> in 1990, uh, CDC formalized a, sort of an existing relationship with the government of Thailand uh, to form the, the Thai HIV AIDS collaboration. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the origins of that collaboration? I mean, why Thailand? Well, Thailand was, uh, it was evident that Thailand was seeing an explosion of HIV in their uh, heterosexual populations. Um, the CDC had a long time collaboration in Thailand, as did uh, Walter Reed in the U.S. Army and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we had an energetic uh, young doctor, Dr. Bruce Weniger, who had been there with the field epidemiology training program, who knew the people in the Ministry of Health and the NIH of Thailand. And um, it was suggested that we might uh, once again uh, learn an important part of the global AIDS epidemic. 
Uh, Thailand was quite different uh, from the African uh, sites. Uh, first of all, more of a mid-range income country with a lot more um, uh, capacity medically and capacity clinically to deal with things, a uh, higher educational system, and, um, and a very good um, uh, reputation for conducting studies. They've been doing many vaccine trials and, and much work with Walter Reed for uh, decades in a lot of um, tropical diseases. So they were keen to do it, and we were keen to, to work with them. So why the explosive epidemic in Thailand? And was it just serendipitous? Would you have found that in Vietnam, in Cambodia, uh, if you had looked? What was special or different about Thailand? Well, eventually, of course, it did uh, go to Vietnam as well. But um, Thailand um, um, it was um, close to the Golden Triangle, uh, where there was a lot of um, drug use with uh, part of Sichuan, China, and uh, Burma. And there were epidemics there uh, in injecting drug users that had been studied early on. Uh, and that was a major concern in testing the blood supply in those countries. Um, and from there, there was a, a, a situation where they jailed many drug users in Thailand, then released them. And following the release, there was kind of a heterosexual epidemic going on that was linking the um, widespread brothels in Thailand uh, to military recruits and others that, who had been tested. Um, Thailand had a long history of, um, of open sexuality and um, um, common brothel use, uh, but they also had open communications. Uh, they had a, a famous minister who had, had uh, done terrific work in population control, who was really the king of family planning in Thailand when they chose to try to reduce the population. His name was Michai Virabrita. And Michai uh, was so successful in condom distribution and uh, family planning, he would, give, uh, he would give all of the beggars condoms. And then they would, whenever they got money, they would give people condoms. Uh, he became so well known that the nickname for a condom in Thailand was Michai. So people would ask each other if they'd use the Michai. When he saw the AIDS epidemic, he volunteered to the princess and to the head of, the, of, of Thailand that he would be the cabinet minister for AIDS. <coughs> Thailand immediately did that, and they had TV shots every hour on the hour about AIDS education and condom use. They went to all the brothels, and instead of saying, we're closing you down, they're saying, we will close you down if you don't use condoms. <coughs> they taught all men not to have sex without a condom. And the incidence rates, and they also had very good laboratories. So they learned, they were the only country maybe to learn from HIV prevalence before people got sick that what was going to happen. So the Thais uh, did zero surveys and found that there was increasing incidence in the military, increasing incidence in other populations and in commercial sex workers, and said, we got to do something about this before our hospitals get filled up. So they appointed Michai as a cabinet member, and he took over and said, we're going to prevent HIV from occurring. And they greatly reduced the incidence. Uh, a, remarkable, a remarkable story, really. Now, they're not totally out of the woods, but they did a, a terrific job. And CDC was part of that, and we were there, Dr. Winninger. So much important work was done in Thailand, uh, <clears throat> prevention of mother-to-child transmission and others. Um, can you reflect on what, what you think some of the, the highlights of that were? Well, the, you know, there was an, uh, an anxiety to, uh, in, from 1993, there was a, uh, the, the AIDS 076 trial, which is a collaboration between NIH and INSERM and the Canadians um, to show that AZT given b during uh, the last stage of pregnancy, during labor and then to newborns, would reduce um, perinatal transmission from something like 25% to 8% or two-thirds. 
Uh, then the question is, uh, what would you do in a developing country where most people don't deliver in hospitals or when people can't be given drugs during the last stage of pregnancy and you may not give it to the newborns? Could there be a simplified measure? And in what was very controversial studies in Thailand, the next year, a very large study was done giving a simplified regimen with a placebo control showing that would work. Now, the placebo control itself was very controversial, evoked um, commentary from the New England Journal of Medicine, Marsha Angel, um, defended by David Satcher, who was director of CDC at the time, as well as the director of the NIH. Uh, and at a point in time, <clears throat> produced very important information which people could move forward in developing countries with. Uh, in today's backdrop, with large AIDS programs around the world and the use of highly active antiretroviral therapy by everybody, particularly pregnant women, it's hard to imagine that study even being contemplated or being seen as important or being tolerated. But it was a breakthrough study at the time uh, conducted by CDC and the Thai government, uh, but under a certain amount of scrutiny. So somewhere around the early 90s, you actually created an international activity in your AIDS division. Um, what led you to that, and was there support for that uh, at the agency? Well, we, there were a couple things. One was that we were always anxious to uh, support these studies, and the studies required a different type of support than domestic studies. Um, they require, they were concerned about currency uh, valuations exchanges, concerns about visas. We often wanted to have people with different expertise from different parts of CDC um, assigned or, or working in those areas. And we needed a focus in our Atlanta office to manage that. Uh, in addition, we had opportunities to go to do short-term consultations internationally in units that were not supervised by us. So it was a focus both for our own staff and for staff of others to get involved in protocol development and, and conducting studies. Did you have support from your supervisors and from the Office of the Director of CDC? I don't remember ever not having support from those people. The, the joys of getting older, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, I think there were, there were times when uh, um, our views might have been thought of as uh, uh, controversial, uh, but I, I felt like I was always defended pretty well. We had, you know, we had some bumps in the road, um, um, and, and, you know, everybody has regrets, but I think that um, the support from in the higher-ups at CDC, particularly for these types of things, were quite good. Over time, you worked quite a bit with the World Health Organization. Um, any thoughts about CDC's collaboration with WHO during some of the early years? We were fortunate that uh, CDC had been working with WHO essentially since CDC's beginning uh, in malaria control and, and other areas, so that there were many contacts. A very important one for us was Dr. Walt Dowdle, who was actively engaged in in the uh, work with WHO in the STD area. Um, Dr. Mann was then recruited to WHO by the Director General of WHO uh, and to work under Fakhri Assad, who was Dr. Dr. Uh, Dowdle's good friend. Fakhri then passed away almost immediately, and Dr. Mann uh, grew the global program on AIDS over the four years into the largest uh, program in WHO's history. Some have said that CDC's AIDS work and its international AIDS work changed the face of CDC. Can you comment <coughs> a little bit overall on, on, on that and on C CDC's international work on AIDS in particular? Well, C CDC has always had uh, a stronger international influence and interest than its budget would indicate. So uh, periodically, uh, 
people at CDC who were scientists or staff or field workers would get engaged in international epidemic problems. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, the beginning of CDC was the malaria control efforts uh, in the late 1940s, which of course was a disease largely not domestic, but of concern of the southern United States. But it, it couldn't simply be looked at as a United States problem. Um, smallpox eradication was uh, central to CDC's work, and many people at CDC uh, worked on smallpox eradication. Uh, one of my colleagues, Larry Zyla, would almost break into tears saying that he, in his career, he worked on the ending of one disease and the discovery of a new disease with both smallpox and HIV. So it was kind of in the lifeblood of CDC employees to want to do global work and to, before many of their U.S. citizen counterparts, to see the world as a global world. I, I would say AIDS itself um, changed global health uh, more than it just changed CDC, but CDC was a byproduct of that. Because AIDS was sort of first recognized in the developed world and then in the developing world, there were so many thousands of scientists and workers who were knowledgeable about this new disease and concerned about it that that concern and knowledge sort of migrated to Africa and other parts of the developing world and led to worldwide advocacy. Uh, I think anybody who worked in global health uh, before 1975 would never have imagined something like PEPFAR, where you'd have a global program largely supported by the United States and other countries, which would involve diagnosing and treating millions of people indefinitely as a, as a commitment. Uh, that was not in the, in the formula for international health work or global health work. So to some extent, AIDS changed the view of global health. And, and at the time, the world was becoming smaller and smaller. And um, it made people think differently about it. So CDC then developed a global AIDS program, uh, which included TB and malaria as bigger efforts, and joined with its immunization efforts to really greatly expand CDC's not only CDC's uh, presence, but CDC's commitment to global AIDS and responsibilities for global AIDS because these were budgeted international efforts. These were not like our original ones, which were kind of begged, borrowed, and rationalized from domestic funds, but these were efforts when people said, here's money, CDC, go do this. And that changed the way we had to look at it, probably part of the reason for the um, commitment by Dr. Frieden to have a center for global health. Any parting thoughts, uh, Dr. Curran? Well, as we mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of us been reflecting back on the beginning of AIDS, and uh, it, it kind of starts with me by thinking with people, uh, you know, where were you in June of 1981? Where were you in 81? And for those of us old enough to remember and who were engaged in it, we have to acknowledge how uh, the AIDS epidemic uh, not only changed the world, but how it changed each of us in, in so many ways. It's, uh, it's not something you uh, walk away from or you uh, underestimate its presence in your life. Thank you.